Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. So when um, I was asked if I would uh, join the committee for the special interest group, I was um, thrilled and I'm, I feel very privileged to be here. So I'm just going to very briefly tell you, uh, introduce myself, um, and then hopefully give you a little bit of a flavour of what it's like from the school perspective. Um, so obviously that's my experience. So um, I've been a teacher for over 20 years and started life in um, South London as a class teacher. Then I was the SEMCO, the Special Education Needs Coordinator and then um, moved into specialist uh, support services, working out of a pupil referral unit in uh, Midlands. Um, and then in Kent, uh, worked for the specialist teaching and learning service, which was um, a mainstream outreach service that uh, went across the um, main areas of need, including learning, communication, interaction, um, social, emotional, mental health, and uh, sensory and physical disabilities. And I was a specialist teacher for um, SEMH, social, emotional, mental health. Um, before the code of practice changed, of course, that was behaviour. So for many years, my, my focus was very much around the behaviours that schools were seeing in their classrooms. Thankfully, we've, we've moved on from just looking at behaviour and have now realised that more than just that going on. Um, and I've just now recently started a new role in Hampshire, which is really exciting um, because it is a joint project with CAMS and Education. And they were both in the same room when I had my interview, which I was particularly excited about. I don't think I've ever known an interview to have both someone from the Education Authority and CAMS sitting asking the questions. So that is quite positive. Um, so yeah, so that's me. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, so <coughs> we're just going to take a quick look at um, understanding the importance of um, assessment and diagnosis from a school's perspective and, you know, from a, a class teacher's perspective, how that kind of trickles back down into the, the reality of um, everyday life in the classroom. Um, just to have a little think about some of those current challenges, um, I'm obviously aware of the challenges that are in school and some of the challenges that are out there in health and social care, but obviously there will be many more challenges that no doubt come and tell me about throughout the day that I'm not yet aware of. Um, and then just some ideas of possible solutions um, and service designs that, that may be worth considering. Um, obviously, Finances is a, a big issue that, you know, um, none of us are necessarily in a, in a position to be um, controlling in any way, but it's still nice to dream. Um, okay. Oh, no, wrong way. Okay, so for me, I think um, it's really important to remember um, that teachers are in many ways the gatekeepers to this whole process. Some children will be identified at a very young age through um, health visitors um, or, or at preschool, um, but actually an awful lot of the children and young people that we're talking about, um, things don't really start to happen until they go to school. And the identification and understanding of these um, pupils is, is really left down to the class teacher. Um, and there's research that, 
shows that actually the class teacher is by far the um, sort of way up the top of the list in terms of the professional that the family will have contact with and sometimes the only professional that that family will have contact with um, and very often it will certainly be the first so the teachers uh, attitudes and um, ability to connect with that family and understand pupils who are maybe beginning to present as different to the majority of their class is really important um, parents will look to, to teachers for advice and support all the time you know uh, every day you, you go into the classroom and there'll be a parent standing at the door because they've got something to tell you you know the child hasn't got to sleep that night or something has happened and to start with it, you know um, it may be a one-off and when it starts to become a pattern then that's when you you know begin to kind of ask some questions about whether something else is going on um, also, schools are very often the ones who actually make the referrals um, on behalf of and, and in collaboration with the parents. So again, them being able to understand what it is they are referring for. And for me, I think that, as Max was saying about this, uh, the kind of multidisciplinary uh, approach and um, also a holistic approach is really important because at the moment in my experience still in many many areas the pathway for one condition is an entirely different direction to the pathway for another condition and actually it's a teacher who's making that decision um, in one of the local authorities I worked in if, if a teacher felt that that child may have social communication difficulties and they wanted an assessment for autism they would fill in one piece of paper and send it off over there to that department but if it was ADHD it went to an entirely different department um, with a whole different set of people and the teacher actually was the one who was ultimately deciding what in collaboration with that Senko so you know and that is still the case in many many areas um, so schools understanding teachers understanding is really vital to get to get it right um, I think you know Mary touched on this kind of shared responsibility of the identification and then intervention and absolutely as teachers we do feel um, that it is our responsibility to make sure that the needs of all children in our class are met um, but that needs understanding and if you don't understand the child or you are misunderstanding the child then actually those supports and um, adjustments are not necessarily helpful in fact they can be very counterproductive um, and uh, I'm just going to touch on mental health I know that I think Anne is going to speak about this later but um, obviously with my SEMH hat on for me having uh, come from behaviour and then into um, looking at behaviour as more of a mental health um, kind of issue um, it's made me realise that the huge numbers of children that are referred to our service for support because of difficulties around behaviour and mental health actually there's a lot of underlying either undiagnosed or misunderstood difficulties um, and just last week I visited about I did about six six school visits um, and I came away and said to a colleague I haven't been to a single meeting this week where ADHD hasn't been uh, mentioned either the child already has a diagnosis or they're on the waiting list um, and and yet schools still don't really seem to understand um, what what ADHD is I mean it's a particular interest of mine but I certainly notice um, you know comments like well, it's not ADHD because he, he can sit still and concentrate when he wants to and you know constantly hearing those comments makes me feel <coughs> that schools don't have enough information so um, once a child you know is labeled as the naughty one or the disruptive one or the lazy one then you start to get these issues with mental health 
um, coming into play as well. Um, and again, Mary mentioned uh, understanding trauma, and I certainly know of situations where a child who has not been understood as a, as a young child in those early years at school actually has experienced significant levels of school trauma because of how they have been treated, um, not, not deliberately meaning to traumatize the child, but because there has not been that understanding by the time that child gets to junior school, kind of um, seven, eight, nine years old, um, they have you know, significant difficulties with going to school, um, with their relationships, with authority, um, with um, being able to get on with their peers, and they're quite traumatized. And I feel that there were many, many cases where this could be um, avoided. Um, so, uh, ment uh, as I say, mental health is right up there on the agenda, which is good because it means there's a bit of money as well. Um, okay, so just very briefly, from a school's point of view, um, at the moment, mental health is the thing, it's everywhere. Um, so, you know, we, we've done autism, we've had a lot of training over the last 10, 15 years on autism. Um, we have had a little briefing on developmental language disorder, um, about half an hour's worth. And um, dyslexia is kind of yesterday's news. So, you know, there are various little screenings that you can put on a laptop and then say to the parents, yeah, yeah, I think maybe they might be or not, really with no understanding of the, the other executive functioning difficulties that some with dyslexia might have. Um, but mental health, this is a biggie. So the pressure is on. Ofsted have changed the framework, came into play in September, and there is more um, emphasis around um, behavior and attitudes and personal development which is a good thing because they are they are kind of moving away a little bit from just the kind of pure results um, but schools have been put into required improvements category or basically failing an office inspection because children haven't made enough progress or the results at the end of Key stage two have not been um, what Ofsted would say is good enough. And so to then have children in your class who are presenting with difficult behaviours and not engaging in the curriculum is a problem for a teacher. You can um, end up on capability if your children do not make enough progress. So you can understand the um, kind of nervousness, I suppose, that, that some class teachers feel when they do have children who are beginning to present with some difficulties accessing the curriculum, um, either with their learning or with their social behaviours or attention, um, that sort of thing. Um, and obviously the Green Paper, um, which has got a huge focus around um, early intervention and prevention, and there is a big emphasis on this happening in schools. So there is a huge expectation from the government that schools and colleges are going to step up and are going to be providing this prevention and early intervention for mental health. And I think that's significant for our children with neurodevelopmental conditions because they are proportionately more likely to end up having some of those difficulties. And I think that in terms of prevention, yet you can't prevent a neurodevelopmental condition, but what you can do is prevent the other issues that in some ways end up causing them more difficulties later on in life than what you know than their difference, <coughs> as I prefer to call it. Um, so yeah, so do, does it have uh, implications? Um, yes, it does, and hopefully Anne will um, touch on that a little bit later. Um, yeah, so um, <coughs> King's College London um, did some research and, you know, three to six times more likely than their peers to have mental health difficulties if a child has got a neurodevelopmental condition. Um, that's really significant for school um, because if a child is not happy, doesn't feel safe, 
um, is it in a state of fight or flight, is highly anxious, is low, has low mood, they are not going to learn. And that may not be because they're not capable of learning, it's because those other barriers are then in place. Um, so schools having a really clear understanding of a child's needs is important. And what I tend to find is they're really good at telling you what a child has a difficulty with. But what they don't really uh, have a deep understanding about is why, and I think Max also um, said this earlier, that um, it's the understanding of why that child finds it difficult to interact with their peers or concentrate on quadratic equations. Um, you know, yeah, we can see that they do, but actually why? And moving away from this model of, oh, you know, they just need to try harder, or they just need to sit still for longer, or, you know, they need to practice their spellings more. Because actually, you, you can't practice a neurodevelopmental condition out of somebody. Um, so, and the other big one for me, which, <laughs> um, I could tell you some stories. The misconceptions and lack of understanding, the stigma and the bias, um, leads to social exclu exclusion, low self-esteem, um, and then inappropriate or inconsistent support and adjustments. Um, and there's a, there's a huge kind of uh, argument, I suppose, at the moment within education, particularly in secondary education, around these two different approaches to uh, managing behaviour. Um, one being the zero tolerance, uh, isolation booths, exclusions which seems to be the answer for for some head teachers versus the more um, trauma-informed approach um, and the prizes for guessing which side <laughs> I sit on um, but um, the you know the stigma and actually for, for, for families um, whole families become excluded from that school community because of difficulties that the children have that are not necessarily understood. Um, so, are these labels helpful? Um, child eventually, after being two and a half years on a waiting list, <laughs> gets uh, a label. Um, well, they're not necessarily unhelpful. I always say to schools, you need to use a label as a frame of reference for support and adjustment. So there's no point just having the piece of paper or the report from the paediatrician that says, yeah, they meet criteria for X, Y, Z, and then just filing it away in your little Senko filing cabinet and doing nothing with it. Um, and then carrying on with your belief that actually it's not really that at all, it's just that the parents are really disorganized and um, life is chaotic, or they didn't go to preschool, so they haven't developed social skills. Um, actually, we, you know, we need to be encouraging schools to move away from that um, and think about those labels as as being a help. Um, it does help a little bit with that shared understanding. So, if uh, a child is new in my class and somebody says, oh, you know, he, he has a diagnosis of ADHD. I have some shared understanding of what that means, but there is not necessarily the same shared understanding uh, with every teacher. Um, and so actually, there's a real need for accurate and up-to-date information. Um, and I did a, a big push on ADHD training at the end of last year in July in Kent. Um, and the schools were amazing, they went a little bit wild for it, uh, they didn't realise uh, actually how popular it would be. I just did a half an hour briefing on you don't know what you don't know, and my inbox was full the next day and I actually didn't have the capacity to go into all the schools, but um, people were left in tears, um, and I was getting comments like, we've never had that uh, level of um, energy in the staff before uh, after a training because everything now makes sense we didn't know this we didn't know that you know 
but now I can see why he does this. Um, and that's because the basic information out there is not really um, up to date, and actually it's not massively helpful um, for many of these children. So yes, they can be helpful if they're used as a frame of re reference and that we can share understanding, but only if that understanding is accurate, which it, it often is not. Um, so it should lead to um, a better understanding of that individual child uh, and guide schools towards appropriate adjustments and support. I know, again, Mary mentioned things like signposting to um, external support, like support groups, um, parent forums. There's still very much a tendency for these things to be split off into their little bubbles. So you might have, um, you know, the parent support group for, AD for ADHD or ASD, not so much together, or um, a group that um, does holiday clubs for children who have physical disabilities or learning disabilities, but there's even within those third sector and charitable kind of groups, it's very, it seems quite exclusive. Um, and I think in that sense, we need to be pulling uh, those support networks together because, you know, more often than not, these children are, are, are going to have more than one um, of these conditions. Um, I think that getting a diagnosis or at least having going through that process and having information about the different kinds of difficulties can really help to develop this strength-based approach. Because we do, sadly, in education, we do tend towards looking at a deficit model. Because we're just looking at all the things that they can't do, and then what can we do to try and get them to do it? And that just doesn't work for many, many of these children. What we need to be looking at is actually what they can do. And then find ways of allowing them to access what we're doing through their way, because their way isn't necessarily the wrong way, it may just not be our way. Um, and sometimes a diagnosis can help with understanding that um, different doesn't have to be deficit. And so recognizing that there are huge strengths um, in these children. Um, and, you know, I quite like to put up my little superpowers poster and say, you know, actually, it, they're not fidgety. They're full of. They're energetic and creative, uh, enthusiastic, um, not disruptive. <laughs> um, so it is a challenge. <coughs> there are lots of challenges. So from my point of view, the things that I see um, as being difficult are huge, huge levels of, of a misunderstanding. Really. Um, across not just um, education either. Um, I remember sitting in a child protection meeting um, and the, the mother was very, very close to having her children removed. And on the, on the plan, um, there were a number of kind of targets and, and, and things that, that she was having to agree to do which she had not been able to do. Now, the child had a diagnosis of ADHD, and the social worker sat across the table from the mother and said, you know, you, you were meant to do this, this, and this, and actually you haven't done that. And I just sat there, my heart sank, and I thought, well, she's not gonna be able to do that because the chances are she has probably got some really similar difficulties to her ch her own child. Actually, she's been living with the child with difficulties and therefore the stress and trauma of that. And, you know, as I think, you know, my colleagues have said before, we I do feel that sometimes we are setting up these families to fail by just seeing things in isolation and not looking at a bigger picture of how to to support whole families rather than just trying to fix 
one child or one problem. Um, so context in which that child is seen can influence people's decisions um, and actually as to whether they refer or even, and get go for assessment or not. So depending on where the school is, if you have a class of beautifully behaved, fairly uh, bright children with really, really supportive parents at home who sit and help them do their spellings, and then little Johnny in the corner as a little bit of a fidget bottom, you know, he is going to uh, stand out. And so, you know, that may cause a problem for him. The school may make some judgments about him, about his home life. Um, but put little Johnny in a school down the road and he will be the best behaved, quietest, most focused child in the room. So they, th these children do not exist in a vacuum. And we need to be aware of the power, I suppose, that education can have on making those decisions. Um, and again, that, that's why I feel it's really important that, that we do more to educate um, uh, school staff about all these different um, differences. Um, as I've said, the single diagnostic pathways sometimes means actually that the decision about whether that child is going to end up getting diagnosed with autism or, or um, ADHD or dyslexia is, is down to the same code. Um, and lots of things get missed or misunderstood. And then this last point here, um, a lack of understanding and recognition between professionals and this culture of criticism. And I have been guilty of it. So I have been guilty of saying, oh, cans, nobody turn up. But actually, I have also heard people who work for cans say the same about teachers. Um, or the, oh, well, they think they've got a hard time having 30 children to look after. I've got a caseload of 150 and 15 suicidal teenagers that I need to deal with in the next 24 hours. So we each have individual challenges, but we're not necessarily understanding what it's like for the other person. And I think we need to move away from that culture of criticism and start making moves towards uh, understanding how, how the other half live. Um, and that could happen at a systemic level, but it can happen at an individual level. And each and every person, whether they're education, social care, accounts, can make it their business to find out who their local contact is and ping an email. You know, even at that level, it may not change the world, but it could make a difference if we start talking to each other. Um, so, just an example here um, around perceptions and stigma. There's a really recent bit of um, research done. In fact, I think um, uh, the, there's a, a podcast by um, Abigail who, who did this, but that there was some research around um, educational practitioners' perceptions of ADHD um, and studying their views of the home lives of children, which is not a very well-researched area. But it was interesting to me, and although this is ADHD, I think it would be the case in, you know, across the board, is that actually educators' perceptions of what is going on at home then leads to uh, judgments and bias, um, which then has an impact on decisions around referrals, assessment, the way in which those lovely little tick sheets are filled in, um, and the information that comes back through to health um, from schools can be massively in affected by schools' perceptions. Um, and the three key things that came up in this particular study were perceived inconsistencies in school, uh, at home, sorry, um, psychosocial adversity and isolation, and things like, oh, it's because they, they lack a male role model. That came up quite a lot. So, yeah, you know, obviously he's got ADHD because he lacks a male role model. Um, 
<laughs> I kid you not, I've heard it myself. Um, and actually, these perceptions really do have implications for uh, what happens around assessment and diagnosis. So there's the um, uh, reference there if you want to look it up. I've got a copy with me as well. <laughs> um, so this bias means that information from schools varies in both its quality and objectivity. Um, and I know that, that teachers bring into the classroom their own personal values about what they feel is acceptable or not, um, and that can impact on then um, what they accept or not in terms of what they see in their class and how supportive or not they are. Um, and they may compare to peers. Schools, I don't think, are always clear about exactly what information is required. So as, as Max was saying, you know, they may tick the Connors sheet, but they may not think it's relevant at all to tell uh, CAMS that there have been a number of adverse childhood experiences. So the school knows that information, but they're, they're not linking together in a holistic way the fact that some of those things may be relevant for um, CAMS to know. Um, so inconsistencies across settings can cause difficulties. Um, so home may say one thing, school may say another. Um, and the lack of training across the board, um, including, including in health, and I've sat in meetings with a pediatrician who has made comments around a child's self-esteem uh, and said, I, you know, I don't think there are any issues around your self-esteem. He's very confident. And I'm think, thinking, <laughs> I think you've slightly misunderstood what, what it means to have good self-esteem. Coming across as being confident is not an indication that this child has good self-esteem. Um, but so that the lack of training can lead to, to um, misunderstanding and <coughs> incorrect diagnosis. Um, and the lack of consistency from area to area in terms of what families experience, but also what schools experience. Um, you know, I had a conversation with Mark who said that he, he you know, he'll go into a classroom when, when a child is, is um, uh, referred to do an observation. I was like, are you kidding me? I, I've never known um, a doctor to go and observe in a class. You know, they, 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 in the areas where I've worked, they've always kind of sent other people to then go and observe and then write something up and then put it in a file and then they, they just read it. So there's, there's a real inconsistency. Um, so I think training is a big one across the agencies and it needs to be up to date. And as far as I can tell, up to date means keeping up with things like the stuff that, that, that ACAM uh, publish, not having a look on the NHS website. Um, uh, initial teacher training is a biggie. I mean, there's virtually nothing. There's a little bit around special needs, but in terms of mental health, and certainly anything around neuro neurodevelopmental conditions will be very small. Um, so at least we can get the teachers, when they're coming in, having some level of understanding, or at least know more questions to ask. Um, I think we all have a moral obligation to challenge misconceptions when we hear them, whether that is in clinic, in the classroom, or in the pub. Because the media and the general public have a lot of things to say about a lot of things that are not... Um, helpful. So I think that would be, be a good thing for us to all be doing. Um, and also this understanding around co-occurrence and that, you know, actually if, if they've got a diagnosis of autism, it doesn't mean that they're not dyslexic or um, it doesn't mean that actually they don't also have difficulties with, with um, coordination or ADHD. Um, and looking at the funding from a local authority level and actually starting to think about this joined up commissioning. Um, so making it your business to connect with other agencies and actually beginning to understand the limitations and the pressures and to be working with and not against 
um, and moving away from that kind of blame. Um, be in the same room. Um, try and make this your your uh, your little uh, challenge between now and Christmas. See if you can get to be in the same room as somebody from another agency in a positive way um, and be working collaboratively. Consulting with family and children. What what helps them? What do they need? Um, is there anything that you can do to help facilitate that? And focusing on meeting the needs of the child rather than the tiers of service. Um, and working with what you already have. So education, uh, professionals see these children six hours a day, five days a week, 38 weeks a year, and boy, don't we know it. They live and breathe these children, and yet we are not necessarily making the most of the skills and dedication and care that, that these professionals um, have. Um, and I think investing in just developing and increasing a bit of capacity in schools could have a huge difference on identification, but also well-being um, and support. Um, and so I think there's you know, a lot of potential for um, developing that kind of capacity. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.